you have your Bibles, open them to Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Last week, we talked in the first set of the Advent, we talked uh, about Mark out of 13, Mark 13. Now we're going to turn to Mark chapter 1. Uh, 13 was the prophecy of Jesus' uh, coming. And one, now we're going to see the story of his actuality, the actual physical presence of Christ showing up. <clears throat> in a sermon entitled, Prepare the Way. Mark chapter 1, beginning verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. And his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. His name was John. People locally knew him as the Baptist. That's what they called him. They didn't call him John, they called him the Baptist. The Baptist guy, the guy who is putting these guys under the water. The Greek word is baptismo. That means to immerse completely. This is where theologically we know the idea of baptism is one of immersion and not pouring or sprinkling. Because it says that Jesus was baptismo. When we look at manuscripts in Greek about ships that sunk at sea, it says they were baptismo in the sea. They had gone under the water. So we, we know the picture here is one of immersion. It is perfect and congruent with Scripture and what Christ would do, that we would be buried with him under and raised again into the newness of life as we come out of it. This is perfect and congruent with that. People knew him locally as the baptismo, Baptists. Some would say to him that he was a religious eccentric, Others less kind would dismiss him as being simply a, a flake, if you will. They, they, they really thought of him oddly. When we look at the history uh, about his mom and dad, they, uh, history tells us that, that Herod the Great probably had his father killed. And so the mother took him into the wilderness, and that's where he was raised there. He appears out of the wilderness. What's ironic, well, no irony at all, it was prophesied that he would come out of the wilderness by the prophet Isaiah. He definitely didn't seem to be the kind of guy that would win friends and influence people. His type of personality was to usher in the news of the coming Messiah. He just somehow doesn't seem to fit in with the shepherds and the wise men and the other characters that we traditionally associate with the Christmas story. Yet this was God's unlikely servant, the one who chose to herald the spectacular event that would follow in Jesus Christ. The most unlikely promotion of man, to be sure. But God's man, nevertheless. Ask yourself this question. Can God use me to affect change in the world? He takes a guy who's rough around the edges, to say the least. And from the very beginning, everything about John was unique. His mother, Elizabeth, was related to Mary. But Mary happened to be a very young girl at the time, whereas Elizabeth was not. Indeed, she was probably the age of 13 when she gave birth. Historians give her between the age of 13 and 16. You came of age as a woman in the first century at the age of 13. You became a woman on that day just like the boys became men on that day. Most scholars put her probably somewhere in between those years. It's not unusual to see that childbearing age. Elizabeth, on the other hand, she was a woman who was in her golden years. 
She had never given birth to a child. You would think that of her kind of in the category of more like a great-grandmother instead of a mother. Yet her aging priest of a husband, they seem to be unlikely candidates as well. That's not out of the question given today's recent advances in medicine, but I'm going to beg the grandmothers that they don't take this as a prophetic <laughs> word and that they just take this as a story as we give it because I don't want to increase the hospital visits with you and babies at this time of the year. <laughs> you never know. And then there's John himself. Being the same age as Jesus, they grow up together. They play together. Yet as they reach adulthood, they were different in so many different ways. When John began his ministry, he lived in the desert solitude of Judea. It's a rugged desert uh, country in the wilderness. It's about 20 miles east of Jerusalem, and it's in the hills that he was raised, and we find him in the garments of the camel hair. He constantly brooded over the scriptures, especially the prophetic ministry of Elijah, after whom a lot of people believed him to be mistakenly. John was also not a very big respecter of persons of rank. He had an intimidating personality, and for that reason, the upper-class folk of the time rejected both he and his message. In Luke chapter 7, and verse 29, it alludes to this. Yet John gathered a respectable following. He attracted many among the lower class, many of whom received baptism by his hands. John even drew a group of disciples around himself, which is significant for two reasons. First, some of these disciples later became disciples of the Lord. Secondly, a number of those people began to think of John himself as being the long-expected Messiah. For this reason, John's gospel, and he felt obliged to specifically point out that there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light, the scripture says. Why is that significant? For some of you, you're sitting here like me when I was a kid. We looked at the Bible and we said, well, well, that's the Bible. That's what people say about stuff in the Bible. But you need to grasp this fact. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are looked at, historic, looked at as historical annals in the world. Did you know that? Do you understand that they hold as much rate historic, with, with historicity as our writers like Tacitus and, and these, other, these other writers in the scripture, like Josephus, that it holds as much weight historically as they. So when we draw from these things, we know these to be true because they're looked at historically. They've been proven historically. There is no contradiction historically to the Gospels and to the world around it as they are written therein. Why is that important? Because it's important and significant in the fact that John makes the point that he is not the Messiah. That he is going to be the one pointing the way. And what he is doing is fulfilling scripture or prophecy that Isaiah had wrote years before. And so as this is fulfilled, we now look at the scripture and we say, not only is it historically accurate, but it's fulfilling prophecy at the same time. And so we come to the Advent. And we think of those that ushered it in. What drew people to John's message? I mean, John was far-fetched in some of the minds there. His austere lifestyle was a compelling reason to listen to him, and perhaps in strange ways convinced people to follow him. And I think many thought that he was Elijah, the prophet who had returned. But there's more to John than simply this bizarre kind of strange life. I mean, you can imagine what kind of an audience you're going to attract as you're standing there in your... Uh, loincloth and camel hair that's made from camel hair and, and you've got this leather belt around yourself and you eat locusts and honey and you're just not you're not fitting into the crowd. It's kind of bizarre and strange. John understood that God was about to do something that would shake the foundations of the earth and he needed to prepare the way for the event. And he did this basically in three ways I want to give you this morning. Number one, John the Baptist prepared the way by living a godly life. I think we need to ask ourselves a question today. 2014 on the cusp of 2015. In an age 
of corruption, John the Baptist appeared as a clean, <coughs> bracing breath of fresh air. <coughs> In his passionate embrace of goodness, he spoke out fearlessly against every form of corruption. When the religious leaders from Jerusalem turned up in the congregation, he did not express delight to see them and feel complimented that he had done them an honor by them attending his service. Instead, he said, O oh, generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? A great preacher once said that the heart that does not know anger is the heart which is not pure. Did you catch that, church? The heart that does not know anger is a heart that is not pure. What does that mean? That means that we ought to be bugged by some of the things that we see on TV today. We ought to be moved at the idea that some of the stuff that's happening in the political world is, is going against the grain of, of what is right and what is wrong. We should be moved at the idea and, and upset about the idea that, that wrong and injustice is being done. We should be moved by those things. When we see things happen on our street, when we see murders and we see rapes and we see these things occurring, we should be moved by that and, and be angered by that and, 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 and be wanting to do something and to cry out to God and say, God, please intercede here same time he asks us to, to love and to be just and to love unconditionally. Church, listen to me. I've preached for four years now. Love your neighbor unconditionally. I think we're doing a good job in that. I look around in the church when people come in and they're a visitor and you guys shake hands and we hug people and we smile at them and we make them welcome. And you're doing a good job to reflect the unconditional love of Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. But listen to me. We're not to buy in to the idea that being tolerant of everything is a Christian ideal. Did you catch me on this? The world is black and white. Right and wrong is black and white. And we ought to be moved by that. Loving unconditionally is one thing. Tolerating sin and embracing it is completely another thing. And so we are to love the sinners unconditionally. But we are to make clear our stance on right and wrong. Amen? Okay. Tough message. This is what John, this is one of the first things that John said, and this is what set him apart. You know, there's a philosopher named David Hume. He was visiting a church every year at this place where he went on vacation. And on one occasion, a man in the party that he was with that he met socially after the service, laughingly said, of course you don't believe all the stuff that that old man is saying, do you? And he was referring to the preacher. David Hume replied, perhaps not. Then why go? And Hume answered, because he believes it. And then he added in an undertone, I wish to God I did too. When people see passion in you, it causes them to question, what is it that is in you that is not in me? It confuses the world when they see truth lived out. The world has no answer to a godly life. Voltaire was once asked whether he completely ruled out God as an atheist. He shook his head and said, I cannot. The man asked him, why? And he said, because I once met Fletcher. John Fletcher was an Anglican priest or, and a close friend of John Wesley. His godly life was legend among people. It was he whom Wesley was designated as the successor to lead the Methodist movement and that group. At the event of his death, Wesley spoke. But Fletcher, though dying first, and Wesley preaching at his funeral, referred to Fletcher, Wesley did, as a perfect man. Historians commented about the amazing impact of his goodness in the community. There is, listen to me, church, 
no answer, listen to me, church, to that kind of life. What do you do when you love somebody unconditionally? What can one say, good or bad? If we go outside of these walls and love people unconditionally, even when they walk away from the church, even though they spite the church, even though they may hate the fact that you go to church, but you don't wince and you love them unconditionally anyway, what is left to be said? You're a nice guy. I hate that person. Why? Because they're so nice. <laughs> You ever been there? I have. Before I became a Christian, this guy that I searched out and going to uh, college in, in, in Southern California at the University of Southern California, was, I was there stretching out on the grass one day. I was stretching with this guy, and I'm an atheist, professed atheist, and this guy's a Christian guy, and we're stretching out before practice, and he was this Christian guy, and he just drove me crazy. He'd ask these questions. He's always nice to me. He'd give me his extra food when we'd go out to eat. And I just, I couldn't ever do anything to the guy because he was just so nice. But it drove me crazy as, as a non-Christian. I just, I would look at him, I'd look at him and say, Ugh, just get away from me. And, and I remember thinking about content being 2020, constantly saying ugly things about this guy. I was just like so mad at him all the time. And then now as a Christian years later, I got to ask myself, why? Why was I so mad? Watch. His spirit and my spirit were in complete conflict. It's oil and water. I could not understand that. It just drove me crazy. Watch this. Watch this. It convicted me. It convicted me because I was not like that. I was convicted at being a jerk. I was convicted <laughs> at, at being, at not having anything good to say about this guy. One day when we were practicing and we were warming up for track, we were jogging around the track, one of my friends, who wasn't a Christian, just was jogging next to me and said, well, why do you hate that guy so much? And right there in that moment, would, would be a thing that would shape me for the rest of my life. I, I wouldn't become a Christian for years later, but it stuck with me when he said, why do you hate that guy so much? And I said, I don't know. I was given an insight to who I really was. Watch this. Who I really was not in Christ. And I didn't even know Jesus Christ was. But for the first time in my life, I tasted the idea that there was something different, something extraordinary outside of myself. Watch this church. And that is the witness we're supposed to have. When people hate you, the scripture says we're to love them anyway. We're to cause them to wonder why would we be consistent. I've been here for four or five years. I've had many people not like me. But we are not to hate them back, the scripture says. We're to love them unconditionally anyway. Amen? Amen. Because of Christ who first loved us. The world has no answer to a godly life. Some years ago, a communist newspaper reporter, before the breakup of the Soviet Union, was doing an in-depth study on Christianity and with some of the missionaries that were allowed to be in that part of the old Soviet Union. Now, for those of you that don't recall the old Soviet Union, and, and you're beyond that now, in those days, missionaries were not allowed to go to the Soviet Union. But to show good face to the rest of the world, they allowed some to come there under controlled circumstances. And so they would allow groups of nuns from Catholicism and, and groups of, of people who would help people with food and those kinds of things, missionaries who would come just to teach food or teach English as a second language. It would allow those to come in as long as the state would be able to oversee it. This reporter was there to write a story 
of how the poverty would certainly break the Christian service. Pierre Garand was convinced that the good works, the loving philanthropy, and the apparent tenderness of these missionary women was just a cover for obtaining financial support from their institution. And so he showed up to write for the paper Pravda in Russia, their state paper at the time, this paper that would expose who they are. He asked if he might accompany one of these ladies during a typical day, and they agreed. She took him down some of the most dilapidated streets that he had ever seen. And in the basement of one house was a man who was terminally ill. The newspaper reporter was accustomed to grim conditions, but these made him wince, he writes. The dirt and the smell were overpowering, he writes. Vermin scurried away, the rats and the mice, as they approached in this room. The sick man was lying on a bundle of rags and was indescribably dirty, he writes. The man was trembling, he writes. He writes, his condition was the product of poverty, disease, alcohol, and drugs. The missionary woman rolled up her sleeves and picked up a bowl and filled it with water from a tap upstairs and began to wash him. <laughs> Suddenly, the sick man jerked up. Ma'am, he whimpered. I'm frightened. The communist reporter said, I stared in unbelief as I saw this refined, cultured woman take that filthy wreck of a man and hold him in her arms like a baby. And suddenly, the hovel that he lived in became heaven <coughs> because love was there. The writer was overwhelmed by the goodness which he saw. He later asked her why she does what she does. And she preached Jesus Christ and what he had done for her. And he said solemnly, I have never known that kind of love. How can I have that? <clears throat> and there, in a dirty place, she took his hand and led him to Jesus Christ in prayer. The world has no answer to the godly life. The only appropriate answer is to try and find the secret of it, to imitate it, and hope others will come to know it themselves. That's how John prepared the way. <coughs> he lived a godly life. Let me ask you, is God preparing the way, this Advent, through the influence in your life? The second thing, that John did, was he prepared the way by challenging the people's sins. One of the towering marks of this age, I believe, listen to me carefully, is the absence of guilt. Not many people would deny that fact. Some are pleased that guilt has been dethroned, actually. Others see it as a bad sign. The absence of guilt in today's society makes it very difficult to talk about sin and the need for repentance. For without guilt, we cannot repent. And the idea or the secret mixed to what the world is influencing our children with is this idea that you are to be tolerant and love everybody. Now, now that is true. We are to love everybody unconditionally. But we cannot be tolerant of the black and white truths of right and wrong. Because then when we are involved in those things, we are blinded and repentance cannot come. We cannot change. We cannot feel guilt. We don't have conviction. What drove me crazy about this guy that I was running with in college was the fact that his life was so good and mine was so not, it bugged me to stand next to him. 
And so many times people don't want to come to church because they're convicted about, about what it is and not because uh, uh, truth is being outlined with unconditional love, but because we as Christians are stupidly looking at them and saying, look how much better I am than you and you've got to clean your life up. And so they don't come because of the hatred they have towards us. They see contradiction in our lives. They see hypocrisy in our lives. They say, I don't want your church. When we love unconditionally, but we make sin black and white. Real conviction, real guilt appears, and the person has a desire to move away from it. They have a desire to change. Watch this church. There becomes a hope. And they ask a question, how can I have that? Is hope available for me? If there's no feeling of guilt, then the need for repentance is greatly minimized, if not altogether eliminated. Tolerance, though, is the new word of the day. By embracing that comes the inability to repent of anything. For many, the word repentance is a word that belongs to yesterday. It's equated with sackcloth and ashes and and mourners and benches and those kinds of things. Some see repentance as something uh, that we do only if we get caught. But repentance is far more than simply blurting out, oh, I'm sorry. If we get caught cheating the IRS or cheating on our wife. Nor is repentance merely turning over a new leaf. Instead, repentance means, watch this, to turn around and go in the opposite direction. That's what John the Baptist wanted his audience to hear. Turn your life toward this one called the Messiah. Repentance is not a negative or a down face thing. Rather, it causes us to look up and look forward into a new life. It is, it is turned away. There is hope there. If you would just repent and turn and follow Christ, your past is erased when you acknowledge him as your Lord. There's nothing mysterious about that. What was done on the cross, cross accomplished it for you. You just let pride down where it is and you walk away. You let the sin you struggle with right there and you walk away. And you say, I'm not going to follow this anymore. I'm going to follow Christ. And repentance is turning in the opposite direction. It breaks the chains of oppression and death that holds us back. Don't get stuck on the notion that repentance means feeling sorry or miserable either. That's Satan just playing a trick on you. Satan will do that, make you feel sorry and miserable, or he will bring pride in and nudge you in the shoulder right before you feel like the desire to come forward and say, you know what, I'm really going to make a public profession. I'm really going to be involved with the church. I'm really going to join. You know, today's the day. He's the voice there at the last minute that says, hey, everybody's watching. And all of a sudden you get a little nervous. You start thinking about what so-and-so might say. That guy over there on the other side of the building, he, he said he lived in my neighborhood. Didn't know how I live. Hey, watch this. We're all sinners. We all fall through the word of God. Amen? It doesn't matter. What your sin is. Christ had to pay for all of them. He wants a relationship with you. It's about you and him. Not about you and your neighbor. Not about you and your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa that goes to a different church. It's about you and Christ alone. Amen? When someone comes forward in this church, you're not converting to Baptists. You're saying, I am following Jesus Christ. And today I become a Christian. And I make it clear to me. That's your decision. Amen? Mm -hmm. It means one more thing, though. True repentance. It means a willingness to confront sin. So John the Baptist had this courage to challenge sin wherever he met it. King Herod had seduced his brother's wife and taken her to live with him. And although the people were outraged, their religious leaders were silent on the issue because they didn't like him. They had to tread carefully. 
Herod could be violent and brutal if provoked, but this wild creature from the wilderness did not consider his own safety. He had his eyes only for God. Here's a mark of a Christian. Watch this. I don't care what people say. I am not going to back down from who Jesus Christ is. Amen? Can we say that about ourselves? Can we really say, if somebody said, deny Christ, would that person's influence on you provoke you to deny Christ? Or would you look at that person and say, not a chance in the world. Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. You know, it's easy to say in America, we have freedoms. I have friends in Malaysia who are ministers there. They're missionaries. And friends of theirs die every day for professing Jesus Christ as Lord. And they choose to stay. It takes a special someone to do that. Watch this. But it takes complete devotion and knowing the truth to be able to stand in the thick of it. Amen? Mm -hmm. The third thing and the last thing that John the Baptist did is he prepared the way by pointing, listen to me, he prepared the way by pointing to the cross, pointing to Christ. John in the desert was in the great tradition of the Hebrew prophets. He was aware that the time was running out. In his burning message, he had no time for the peripheral matters that were going on. He was not playing uh, on the ideas of trivial things or trivial pursuits, nor was he prepared to splash about in the shallows of these things. What do I mean by all that? He wasn't preaching to something to make you feel good and fuzzy. He wasn't concerned about saying, oh, I want to build this church up to be the biggest church in the land, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do, which includes not talking about sin or not talking about the things that hurt you. I don't want to, I don't want to rub you the wrong way. I, I, we want people to come listen. He wasn't concerned about those things. He said the truth is the truth, whether you like it or not. And whether you want to embrace it or not, you're going to have to choose to follow Christ and stand for him and live for him. But the truth is black and white. And so he preached it just like that. They were intrigued by his <coughs> excuse me, strange phenomenon of this wild man preaching repentance. His dress, I mean really, and his diet, and, and his, his fierce voice, the scripture says in history writes about how he was just constantly in the face of whoever it was. He didn't care who was there. They wanted to interview him and then tell all their friends about this remarkable experience. Who are you, they asked. And here was his curt answer. I am not the Christ. They said, then are you Elijah? You'll notice. They wanted to build him up into something bigger. Are you, are you this famous prophet reborn? No, he said. Then who are you? They persisted. And John's answer ought to be the ultimate goal of every preacher and every Christian. I am just a voice pointing towards the cross. It was John's crowning glory that he saw something which no other one had recognized. It is true that others had anticipated that God would intervene in human affairs. They had predicted that the Messiah would come as the head of the conquering army. This is what they thought it would be, the Lion of Judah. Uh, they, they thought it would be a fight for sure. But this wild man in the wilderness saw the heart of a nation and into the mind of his God. And the insight has left for us and our children forever the idea of behold. He cries as he sees Jesus approaching the river. John the Baptist says, historically, as he sees Jesus coming towards the Jordan, behold, not the lion who will conquer and destroy, but behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now 
let me let me refresh your minds in 2014 about the Lamb of God. Watch this. Watch this, church, right here. Very important. The Jews understood what a lamb meant. Watch this, church. It meant a sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Watch this. Behold the only way you can get to heaven is to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sins. Something you cannot do, but only he can. Not all the accountability in the world. Not all the good deeds in the world. Only what Christ did for you. Watch this. Here's what he did. Are you ready? I love you. Exactly the way you are. With all the blemishes. With all the hurt. I love you. Just the way you are. Will you come follow me? There is no greater privilege given to any man this side of heaven than to point to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's stand together. As they come, play softly. Here's my question for you this morning. A. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? What does that mean, preacher boy? It means this. That you understand who Jesus Christ is. That you accept what he did for you on the cross. That you believe that he was buried and raised again from the dead so that you could have eternal life. And eternal life starts when you say, I am going to walk away from my old life, right here, and follow Jesus Christ. When you come forward, the scripture says, Jesus said, whoever stands up for me in front of men, I will stand up for him in front of my Father in heaven. But the verse right after that says this, but whoever will deny me in front of men, I will deny him in front of my Father in heaven. He makes it black and white. I wish I could paint it fuzzy and say, yeah, all you have to do is do it where you are. That's not the truth. You have to walk away from your old life and follow him. The second thing is for those of you who've already accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to be involved in a church. God wants you to. He says not to forsake the assembly together of other believers. It is in that body that I will use you. And when he calls you to join a body of believers, he's going to put you to work. I'm not saying you're going to be preaching or teaching, but he's going to do something with your life that is going to affect change in other people's lives. And part of your service is proof of what's going on in your heart. So those are the two things. If you need to accept him as your Savior, we're not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to pray. <laughs> you. you need to join a church, you come. Quit goofing around. So God, here I am. Use me. Come as we sing together.